He is risen. risen We'll try that again with everybody awake. (laughs) He is risen. risen Our call to worship this morning is Psalm 98, verse 1 and 2. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. Amen. I ask you to stand as you are able and we'll sing number 367, Christ the Lord is risen today. Please be seated. Welcome to each and every one of you on this very special day in the Christian calendar that we get to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. And I trust as we worship together that we will all be blessed by this service. And we invite all of you downstairs afterward for a time of fellowship uh, and enjoying our brand new floor. So, uh, looks absolutely wonderful. I commend the building committee for all that they have done to get to this point. In way of announcements, um, on your bulletin, April the 28th is the Midwestern Association Spring Celebration, to which each and every one of you are invited to. If you do want to attend, please let Shannon know today because she has to send in an amount of people that will be coming. So if you wish to attend, Please see Shannon after the service and tell her that you are coming. There are no tickets to buy, just, they just need to know a, a number. Thursday is the adult social. So all of you that feel you are adults are more than welcome to come. And if you're like me and you don't feel like you're an adult, you're still welcome to come. So uh, all of you are welcome to 
come to the adult social on Thursday at 12 o'clock. This time I would like to lead you in the prayer of invocation and for those of you who are visiting with us partway through the prayer of invocation I will be stopping for a time of silent personal prayer. Shall we pray? Christ the Lord is risen today. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Father God, we sing a new song to you today, for he is risen, so now all nations and people share the good and lasting hope through the shadow of the cross with the glorious sunrise of Easter morning. We praise you, O Lord God Almighty, for planning our salvation before the world began, and we bow in humble reverence before your throne of grace, singing songs of praise to your glory this morning. Thank you, Father, for listening to our prayers of praise and petition. Thank you for bowing down to hear each of us in silent personal prayer at this time. Lord, you in your great love and mercy have given us a living hope through the resurrection of our Savior. And as we continue to walk towards the day when you call us to your eternal rest, be with each and every one of us. What a joy and a privilege it is to be able to come and worship you with our faith sisters and brothers on this glorious morning. Open our ears, calm our minds, as we are blessed by today's message, Easter when nothing means something. For indeed, the nothingness of the tomb that first Easter morning is the reason all who make you Lord of their lives live in the blessed promise of the resurrection. Bless Pastor Shannon as she delivers this message with you guiding her every word that it may be to your glory. Abba, Father, accept our songs and prayers and your message as we bring you honor and glory and praise as we bring this before your throne of grace, because he lives, we can all face tomorrow, because there is nothing in the tomb, because where he lives, where he lives, we have the joy of that blessed message that reverberates around the world, the good news of peace and the new life we have in God forever. Amen and amen. This time, I invite you to stand once again and sing, we will sing number 360, Jesus Christ is risen today.
Please be seated. Our responsive reading this morning is on the back of your bulletins and it is also on the overhead. I would like to lead you in the responsive reading at this time. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. In his great mercy, he has given us a new birth in a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Jesus has, Jesus has come that we may have life and have it to the fullest. He is risen if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, and the old is gone, and the new has come. He is risen God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. Amen. This time I will ask the ushers to take up your offering. Shall we pray? Father God, on this beautiful spring morning, we thank you that our Savior has risen. We thank you for the renewal of spring. We thank you for the trees that are starting to come out and bud as this grass starts to turn greener. And Lord, we thank you for the many blessings that you continue to shower on us day after day, week after week, month after month. And Lord, as we have collected this offering, we ask that you use it to the upbuilding of your church as we all continue to strive towards the time that we can spend eternity with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Children's hymn. How many children would like to join me up front? Did we give them instruments? Come on up here, guys. I promise not to, not to pinch or bite. Come on up front, right all the way up here. Ensemble is ready. I ask you to stand and we will sing number 368 because he lives. He lives. He lives. Just the time I need him, he 
Nothing like a group of children to put smiles on everybody's face. We'll have the children's story at this time. Yeah, you just have a seat right there. Or, or not. Okay. <laughs> well, good morning. Did you see how happy you made everybody? Do you know you made us happy? When you were up there singing and playing, you did. You made us happy. And that's why we're here today, because Jesus makes us happy. Uh, yes, it says children's moment up there. Yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> Have any of you... What do you think this is? An egg. It's an Easter egg. Has anybody gone and looking for Easter eggs yeah. today already? Yes. Wow. So you found eight of them? So <laughs> you did very well because I haven't found any. At my house, there's none. But I did find this. So what was, did, was there something in your Easter egg or what was it made out of? Uh, treats. treats. Were in it? Were, was it made out of chocolate? It was made out of plastic, but there was good things inside, yeah. right? Well, I, I need somebody to open this one up. 
Okay. <laughs> oh. Ew. <laughs> hey, this isn't a treat, really, is it? It's a plant. And this reminds us, this is what Easter is all about. This reminds us that at one time, people were glad to see Jesus, and they threw down palm branches because they were so happy to see him. But then something happened. Um, now I just have to make sure. Oh, oh, here's another one. Okay, so you open up, carefully open up that one. There's money in there. No, no, we're going to keep it in there. <laughs> I'm not going to ask what your name is. <laughs> because this money is all, is, reminds us about Easter too. And believe me, there are 30 pieces of, yes, no, silver. 30 pieces of silver in here, and that reminds us that some people, they were glad to see Jesus, Right? They, they put their, their cloaks and their coats down and they put branches down because they treated him like a king. But then there was a man who, for 30 pieces of silver, he, he betrayed Jesus. He, he told on Jesus. He wasn't a friend of Jesus. So for 30 pieces of silver, he, he, he betrayed Jesus. He, yeah. He, he wasn't... He didn't keep his friendship with Christ. Um, then we come to, we have, an, oh, we have a couple more here. Oh. Yeah, you, you can open this one up. So what do you see in there? Right, there's four Thanks. There's four nails in it. And then, so we went from people going, hallelujah, Jesus is here, Jesus is my friend, to he's not my friend, and I'm going to get him arrested, to people were afraid of him, and so they, with three nails, they nailed him to a cross. That's why we have a cross at church. And they killed him. So that reminds us of Jesus died for us. And then our last one. Do you want to open that one up? What's in that one? There's nothing in that. And that's why we're so happy today, because Jesus died, and then he was buried, and when they went where, he, where they lived, it was so hot, they buried people in a big cave. So and they put a big stone in front of it, and then when they went to, to check on Jesus in the cave, and we're going to kind of pretend this is a cave, he wasn't there. Because God raised him from the dead. God took him back to heaven. So that's why we're so happy today, because God did what he said he would do, and he has power over even death. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for each one of these children, and we would ask your blessing, your rich blessing upon each one of them, that they would come to know you personally, that Jesus would be their Savior. And Father, thank you for these symbols of what you have done for us. Lord, we praise and honor you. Through Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, thanks for your help. You can go find the finger school.
you know, when, when the kids were up here singing, I thought, oh, you know, do I go ahead with this thing with the eggs and, you know, the symbols? Maybe it's too much. It's too complicated. But then I thought, you know what? Jesus said, bring them, come, let them come on to me. So um, he will work in them. <laughs> um, this morning we have a chance to pray together. Any um, praises you have or concerns and I invite you to share any with us now that we can include. Mark. <laughs> yes. Yes. Jim. Yes, I'm thankful that I talked to a lot of people the past week and they haven't been feeling well and they're getting at the end of the sickness now and I just pray <coughs> their sickness is done with for the season. Thank you. Yes, Sharon. Yes, Bob. I want to just praise God for the number of people that are here and the beaming faces on those kids. Yes, yeah, <laughs> yes. Yeah, that was a treat. That was a treat. Sorry, did I see another hand up? Oh, yes, yeah, Cindy. I'd like to say I'm glad that God is using her one Sorry, you're good. Yes, thank you. All right, let's go to God in prayer. Everlasting God, on this resurrection morning, we give you thanks on this Easter morning when the tomb was empty. We give you thanks for your love, which sent Christ, and we thank you for your power that raised him from the dead. We remember Jesus who consented to suffer and die for us. Help us to be true witnesses to his sacrifice and the forgiveness that we know because of him. Today, Almighty God, we celebrate the fact that death could not hold Jesus in the grave. And we rejoice that you grant us eternal life when we accept Jesus as our Savior. <clears throat> we praise you for bringing us to this day so that we may lift up your name grateful for the gift of salvation we know through faith in your son jesus thank you for the new life we see in your created world the birds the budding trees and the green grass father grant us new life in you renew your spirit within us and awaken those souls who have not claimed you as lord so that they may repent and know what peace and joy you impart in the lives of those who believe in you. Almighty Creator, forgive us for failing to acknowledge you. Forgive us for leaning upon our own strength and understanding. Forgive us for failing to love you and for failing to do what we should. Father, have mercy upon us. Today, blessed God, we gather to remember and celebrate you. We remember Jesus who healed the sick and raised the dead. We thank you for the healing that we have seen in lives around us. Lord, we thank you for each person that is here that has taken time to honor you. Lord, we thank you for the children that were here and the joy that they bring into our lives. Father, we ask that your healing touch would be on those who need it. 
those who need physical healing, those whose spirits are groaning, Father. We ask for your healing touch upon them. We thank you for the Bible studies. We thank you for the lessons that you teach us and for the fellowship that we experience in these groups. God, we, we thank you for this time with family and we ask for safe travels as we traverse the roads and uh, Lord, just keep us alert and uh, help us to be an aid to others that might need it on the way. Father, we ask for your blessing upon Trish. Lord, we ask that you would grant the doctors wisdom in her treatment. And as we have prayed already, we ask for healing upon her. In the in the comfort of your presence here this morning, Father, we hear of flooding and fire and all kinds of crimes that man commits against man. Our hearts and prayers for peace and healing and justice go out to Sri Lanka, where coordinated bomb blasts have killed and hurt people in three cities, in churches and in hotels. Lord, help us to help. Father, we know that your will, your plans prevail. Guide us so that we may be your light and wisdom. For Tripoli, for the Ukraine, Lord, bring peace and may your authority rule. Help us celebrate the new life that we have in Christ. And as our Savior taught us to pray, let us together pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat> This morning's text is taken from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 15, starting at verse 42 and continuing into the 16th chapter and ending at the 7th verse. <clears throat> Hear the word of God. It was preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath. So as evening approached, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that he was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When he learned from the centurion that it was so, he gave the body to Joseph. So Joseph bought some linen cloth, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome 
bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He is risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him? But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Thanks be to God for his word to us today. Before I begin, please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you for your word. And Lord, may what is spoken here be your truth. For Christ's sake we pray. Amen. What changes your world? Paint color can change your surroundings and affect your mood. If you've seen any of those home improvement shows lately, any that I've seen, Uh, Gray seems to be the popular color these days and tearing down walls so that you have clear sight lines and open living, that seems to be the thing. What else changes your world and my world? I think it would be safe to say that new life changes our worlds. And we saw some of that here today in the children. Marriages and the arrival of children and grandchildren changes the shapes of the bodies bearing those children, and it alters our thoughts, they impact our days and decisions. As most of you know, our youngest son is getting married in a couple months, and so that is changing the way my husband Dan and I look at Um, desserts especially in these coming days. Friends can change our opinions. Do you notice if you have a friend who is sarcastic or gossipy that that rubs off on you? Sometimes your friend's habits become your habits. Traveling can change our outlooks. Psychologists say that money can change our personality and character. World news can change perceptions and attitudes. It can instill fear when we hear about the possibilities of war, the volatility of financial markets, and the instability of governments. Yet as much as these things can change our surroundings and our opinions, our outlooks, our character, our perceptions, our decisions, and our attitudes, they are only temporary. The mood changes when we repaint a room. I remember years ago, we gave our our sons the ability to choose whatever color of paint they wanted for the room. One guy chose purple and orange, (laughs) and the other guy chose blue and white. Those rooms were forever changed in their mood and personality. Needs and opinions and activities that we engage in change as families grow and as friends come and go. Trips come to an end. Our anxieties around world events and investments ebb and flow as those influences on our lives are in a constant state of flux. 
all these things can temporarily change an aspect of us or something about our situation or surroundings. However, it is when there was the revelation of a nothing that happened almost two centuries ago that not only meant something, it changed everything. The tomb of Jesus the Christ was empty. The body of Jesus was gone. All the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all tell us about it. It's pivotal and so important to our well-beings, our families, our outlooks, and our futures. In all accounts, the stone is rolled away from the tomb and the body of Jesus is gone. The tomb was empty of the actual physical body of Christ. You'll notice in today's reading, I also included the record of Jesus' burial, which meant that today's chosen scripture text was longer than normal. Physically, these 13 verses took more space in the bulletin and served to push other announcements and items out of today's order of service. But isn't that representative of what God's Word should do in our lives? The events, the revelation of the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus as the risen Christ should push away other distractions in our lives. We need to make room for the emptiness of that tomb in our lives. For it is that emptiness that means something. It is that emptiness that changes us. The emptiness of Jesus' tomb means that Jesus is who he said he is. He is the sinless and pure Son of God who allowed himself to be sacrificed for our sin. When we, with eyes of faith, can peer into that hewn out cave and see that emptiness, and believe Jesus was raised from the dead by the power of God, our lives are forever changed. When we have faith in Jesus, our past is forgiven, our future is eternally secured with God, and our present, our here and now, is victorious as we grow in love and knowledge of him who guides and sanctifies us. There are a whole lot of people who do not want to acknowledge this empty tomb. And sadly, again, as, as we were coming up and listening to the news, we heard about the attacks on churches in Sri Lanka. And that's why there are attacks on churches, because they don't want to hear about, they don't want to acknowledge the emptiness of the tomb. They don't want to acknowledge who Jesus is and what he did for us. Because there's no other person or religious icon that sacrificed themselves for us. There are a whole lot of people that don't want to acknowledge this empty tomb. Instead, they choose to harbor emptiness in their lives, substituting the finite for the infinite. There are people who are desperately trying to fill the emptiness in their lives. There are people who substitute the gaudy things and experiences for the godly, joyful, healing presence of the wonderful counselor we know as Jesus. 
It's a strange thing to say that this emptiness, this empty tomb from which Jesus arose is a stumbling block for others. How can someone trip over and stumble over nothing? Well, if you're anything like me, and I don't mean to scare you by saying that, if you think back to your teenage years or even some of us as recently as this morning, some of us trip over our own feet. Whether in our younger years, maybe it was because our, our feet were growing faster than we realized. I don't know, but some of us could trip over a shadow. And that is what happens with people. They're tripping over, they're stumbling over the nothingness of Jesus' tomb. They trip over even the shadow of the cross and what Jesus accomplished on that cross. But we, we preach Christ crucified. To some it is a stumbling block, to others foolishness, but to those who are called, it is the power of God and wisdom of God. This eyewitness account we have before us describes Joseph as a member of the powerful Sanhedrin, the final authority in Jewish law. The Bible describes him as one who was not only waiting for the kingdom of God, but as one who had not consented to the decision made by his colleagues to arrest Jesus. Yet, Joseph, was, Joseph went boldly to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate was surprised to hear that Jesus was already dead. Summoning the centurion, he asked him if Jesus had already died. When Joseph learned from the centurion that it was so, the soldier gave the body of Jesus to Joseph. And as was the Jewish custom for someone who had bled and died a violent death, Joseph wrapped Jesus' body and buried him that same day. For leaving a corpse unburied through the night for any reason was considered sinfully disrespectful. And added to that, the Sabbath was approaching when no burials were to take place. This meant that Jesus' body needed to be buried without delay for it was prohibited to touch a dead body on that holy day. The book of John tells us that Nicodemus accompanied Joseph. In fact, he brought about 75 pounds of myrrh and aloes to prepare Jesus' body for burial. And this morning's text tells us that Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, were also with them because they saw where Jesus was laid. So when these women and more returned when the Sabbath was over, bringing spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus, very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, the, questions on their, the question on their mind was, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they got there, they looked up and saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him? But go tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Notice the Bible does not record the women asking any questions. 
The angel already knew who they were looking for. He even describes Jesus as the one who was crucified and risen. He invites them to look and see that Jesus no longer rests in the place where Joseph and Nicodemus had lain him. Those women sought Jesus. They rose early. They were prepared to serve the Savior with spices to anoint him. And when they had witnessed the emptiness of Jesus' tomb, that he had risen, the messenger of God gave them a job, just as he gives us a job. They were to testify to the emptiness, they were the first human witnesses to that emptiness. For that emptiness was a fulfillment of Jesus' promise. That emptiness testified to his faithfulness. It was just as he had told them. Jesus was not only the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies. While Jesus walked on this earth, he affected a lot of people. Jesus honored the man John by being baptized by him. Jesus healed countless people. Matthew 4 records that news about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures and the paralyzed, and he healed them. And isn't that interesting that the Bible says news about Christ spread all over Syria. And where are some of our refugees coming from today? They're coming from Syria. So when you think about it, we are living amongst ancestors of those healed by Christ. The scriptures, the inspired word of God states that Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, the author says, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. Jesus affected rich and powerful men like Joseph and the Sanhedrin. Jesus impacted the lives of criminals and soldiers, of shepherds and farmers, tax collectors and businessmen, fishermen and craftsmen, of Jew and Gentile, politicians and philosophers. You name them, Jesus affected them. And from amongst them, he rose up disciples. Yet every single one of Jesus' disciples betrayed or abandoned him. One of his disciples, one of the men that had been called to be with Jesus and entrusted with the group's finances, Judas betrayed him. Every one of Jesus' disciples betrayed or abandoned him. Andrew, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas, Simon, who is called Peter, denied knowing Christ three times before the rooster crowed, as Jesus foretold. Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, and Simon the Zealot had all betrayed Jesus Christ. Scriptures read that when Jesus was arrested at the Garden of Gethsemane, all the disciples deserted him and fled. Each one of us has deserted Jesus and fled. We have betrayed him. We have abandoned our God every time we have not taken the higher road, not sought God's help, refused to bend to his will, 
refused to thank God for all that he has done for us. If not one of the men that saw Jesus actually perform miracles remained faithful, how can we claim such? If not one of the men that actually heard Jesus teach with such authority had the nerve to publicly acknowledge him, how can we claim to be so loyal? If not one of Jesus' disciples could live as righteously as their living master, how can we be so arrogant to claim such perfection on our own merits? We have to accept the fact that extreme measures had to be taken. And out of love, God did that. God sent his son. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. For if while we were God's enemies we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? And I know it's tough to hear about our own imperfection when we're dressed in our Sunday Easter best. However, it is not until you and I admit that we have sinned against God, that the, emptiness, that the emptiness of his tomb means something. Unless you can see into that empty tomb with eyes of faith, you'll never understand what that empty space means and nothing will change. Your mood, opinion, outlook, your attitude, your character, your perceptions and attitudes will not change. For we are made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Jesus suffered the injustice of being wrongly accused, of paying for wrongs that he did not commit. He was verbally insulted and humiliated, physically tortured and suffered death for things that you and I have done against God. He was betrayed by those closest to him. That's why he is the one and only mediator that we have, because he's been there. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, this Prince of Peace, this mighty Counselor, took it all for us. Our sins, our disobediences, nailed him to the cross where the weight of those sins of the world pulled him down to death. However, on the third day he arose by the power of the Father, he is the Son of God, and he lives and reigns with his Heavenly Father this very day. When we proclaim this as God's truth, when we <clears throat> repent of our sins, when we believe in that emptiness of his tomb, we are filled with the presence of God. And that changes everything. No longer are we trying to get into heaven by good deeds. No longer should we feel alone because Jesus is with us. No longer will our focus be selfish, for Jesus bids us to care as he did. No longer should we be tossed to and fro by emerging philosophies. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. No longer should we fear the news of the world, for we know that the world is his and we have eternal life. 
Jesus, who was crucified, is not here and has risen, just as he said. Jesus has risen, just as he said. Today and every day, celebrate the love that God has for each one of us and his faithfulness in doing just as he said. We are told to repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Let the emptiness of the tomb of the risen Redeemer change your life. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you have laid the burden of sin upon us. Lord, and for some of us, it has been many years since we first invited you into our lives as our Savior. And if there's anyone here this morning that wants to pray that prayer of salvation, if there's anyone here that wants to renew their commitment to Christ, let us pray. Jesus, Son of God, I believe you died for my sins and were raised from the dead by the power of the Heavenly Father. Forgive me my sins and bless me with the power of the Holy Spirit so that I may be led by you to honor and glorify you in this life and life everlasting. Amen. We have reason to sing. Let us sing our final hymn, Because He Lives. Please stand as you are able.
you for joining us today and I will leave you with a benediction. Please know that you're more than welcome to join us downstairs afterwards as well. May the loving power of God, which raised Jesus to new life, strengthen you in hope, enrich you with his love, and fill you with joy in the faith. Amen. <laughs>